Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am Emily Nimzikant here at the Nebraska Library Commission filling in for our regular host Krista Burns. Um, Encompass Live is the Nebraska Library Commission's weekly online event. Um, it is free and open to anyone to watch. These one-hour sessions um, take place every Wednesday at 10 a.m. Central Time and they include a mixture of presentations, interviews, book reviews, and Q&A sessions, basically anything, um, presented by either Nebraska Library Commission staff or guest speakers. Today we do have a guest speaker, um, Karen Jensen from the Teen Library Toolbox, and her guest, um, young adult author Krista Desir, are here to discuss using young adult literature to talk with teens about sexual violence and consent. So take it away, Karen. Um, okay, thank you. Um, Hello, my name is Karen Jensen. I have been a young adult librarian for 20 years. I am currently working in, um, at the Grand Prairie Library System in Texas, Grand Prairie, Texas. Um, and I work with ages, um, well, third grade through 12th grade. Um, and as she mentioned, we're doing a project this year um, called the, the SVYA Lit Project. We're using young adult literature to discuss sexual violence and consent um, in the life of teens. Um, and how to talk to them using these books. There's several people helping me with the project. Um, two of them are not here today. One is author Carrie Misrovian. She's over there on the right-hand screen at the top. And author Trish Doller. Um, and they have written several posts and have been talking with us. They're not here today, but I am very excited to have Krista here with us. And she's going to take a moment to introduce herself. Hi everyone, I'm Krista Desir. I am a young adult author. Um, I also have uh, a lot of background and experience in sexual violence and activism in this community. Um, about 20 years ago now, um, I started as a, a rape victim advocate in hospital ERs and I did that for about a decade. Um, and then I started um, working, doing speaking engagements and becoming part of a project called the Voices and Faces Project, which is about survivors and giving a voice and face to survivors. Um, and part of that is a writing workshop um, for survivors that is geared towards empowerment. Um, and then more recently, I'm actually returning back to hospital ERs to work with rape victims in that capacity, um, which is like rape crisis counseling kind of thing. Um, so obviously, I have a lot of passion for this topic. Um, my first novel, Fault Mine, is about um, sexual violence told from the point of view of a boy who's... Uh, girlfriend was uh, gang raped at a party that he was not attending. And it's sort of um, the fallout of their relationship and the aftermath of, um, of the rape from his perspective. Um, and uh, I have a, another novel coming out uh, in October called Bleed Like Me, um, which is sort of a, a, a YA Sid and Nancy kind of, oh man. But someone's got a train in the background. <laughs> um, it, it's a YA Sid and Nancy about um, self-destructive, uh, two self-destructive teens who get in a relationship that is equally destructive. Um, so yeah, that's sort of me. Excellent. Um, <coughs> excuse me, let me tell you a little bit about how this project got started and what we're trying to do. Um, a few years ago, um, we all know the, Steuben, the Steubenville rape case happened, and um, I wrote a blog post on my blog, Teen Librarian Toolbox, um, about it. I felt very strongly about it, and of course, after 20 years of working with teens, I've had lots of conversations with teens who occasionally will, in a one-on-one -on -one situation, tell you something about their lives, and um, you know, you learn some of the things that are happening in the lives of your teens, and I have had several um, teens who've come to me and talked about the history of sexual abuse in their lives. So it's something that I've always been very aware of and very um, passionate about. Um, and so coupled with just what happened with the Steubenville case and having the blog um, and, and finally having a way to, to be active and have a voice, um, I started blogging about it. And then um, the, the three ladies, Carrie, Krista, and Trish and I, um, I think last December, put together our first kind of online chat about it. And we had such a successful experience with it, we decided to turn it into a whole project and create a whole resource guide about it. 
So our, our project goals are to then to discuss sexual violence in the lives of teens and why literature on an ongoing basis. And we do that in a variety of ways. We do that, like I said, in blog posts. We have every other month a, a online live chat using the Google Hangout. Um, and as you can see, there's we've had lots of authors involved. You can go back and watch some of the old chats, get totally different perspectives. Um, to raise awareness of the issues and of the titles that can be used to discuss the topics with teens, what we really want to do is um, talk about the literature and what we can learn from the literature and what we can help teens learn by talking about the literature with them. Um, obviously, we want to put together a variety of resources and we're going to share some of those with you here today. Um, and then, you know, I'm always, as a librarian, always about promoting teen literature and reading. So, um, you know, that's just a corollary goal here. But what we really want to do is talk about these, these issues um, and how they affect teens and what we can learn and how we can use what we learn to better serve teens and help them navigate, you know, the teenage years. Um, so what we do is we have a project hub. It's at the teenlibrarytoolbox.com. There's a link to it there, or you can just go to the website, where we link all of the posts and all of the resources that we find. We also have a Tumblr um, that we use, and um, I like Tumblr because it creates, if you cl click on the archive button, it creates a very visual archive so you can see everything um, that's there. And what you'll find there are um, book reviews. As we find new books, we review them, we talk about them, we talk about what we've learned from them, what we think about them. We have book lists of a variety of different topics, articles, stats, current events, we share news stories. Um, I found some really neat curriculum that can be used in a school, like the state of Pennsylvania has developed a curriculum on discussing and teaching sexual harassment in the school environment. For grades K through 12, it's a really great curriculum, um, and so, and it's already there, so that's a great resource to use. Um, and then when we find discussion guides for various books, we share them, and just really anything we want to share. On that. Yeah, and can I just jump in real quick and just say um, part of why we wanted to talk about this issue um, and create a dialogue in this issue um, through YA literature as opposed to nonfiction or, you know, other venues was that um, we all sort of felt like um, it created, when you're using fiction as a medium as sort of a jumping off point to start talking about this issue, there's a little bit of a safety there. Um, I think that a lot of times teenagers won't necessarily, you know, if they've been survivors of sexual violence or if they know someone who's been a survivor, they're not necessarily going to go through the nonfiction self-help section of a, of a bookstore or a library to find that information. A lot of times, at least with me and, and my book, you know, this a, a lot of people have come to me or, or teenagers have come to me, readers have come to me and said, you know, this was my story or, or I really connected with this. <laughs> And they connect in a way that um, I think is a little bit more accessible than them sort of seeking out a how-to guide or anything else. Um, and in terms of fiction, you know, it, it creates a dialogue in, in a pretty safe space because even if you're critical of the characters or you're critical of the things that are happening, it feels a little easier to to be able to criticize that or to be able to be honest about how you feel about things or, or those kind of things because you're talking about, you know, made up people. And, and there's a little bit of a safety in that. So anyway, I just wanted to add that to um, part of why we wanted to do it through this venue. That's an excellent point. And, you know, so for me, um, I don't really talk very openly about it, but I, as a, in the, my eighth grade year, had a, an experience with some sexual violence, and through this project, one of the books that I read was almost exactly like my experience. That was a very validating moment for me, um, and, you know, I mean, I took a few days, and I shut down, and I couldn't, like, I'm not going to talk about this, and I'm not going to read anything, um, but then it's helpful to have, like, I can talk about it in an abstract way through these books and not have to talk about my own personal experience. So you raise an excellent point. Um, thank you for that, Krista. No problem. Um, so part of the reason why we are 
are doing this and we really think that it's important, we just want to give you a, a couple of good um, some stats to begin with. It depends on what stats you use, but um, by the time they are 18, anywhere from one in six girls, I've heard as low as one in three girls, and anywhere from one in eight boys to as low as one in five boys will have been the victim of some type of sexual violence. So by the time that they're 18, you know, it's already a pretty common experience. So we know that this is happening to the teenagers that we're working with, that we're talking to, that we're spending time with. And so understanding that is really important. Um, and we know, of course, this year there's been a lot of discussion in the news about what's happening in our colleges. And um, the current stats are like one in four female students is the victim of some type of sexual violence in, co in college. Um, and of course, there are also male victims, and it's important that that always be noted um, because it, you know any sexual violence is, of course, a problem, and we want to address it. But we know that by the time that kids are getting to college, it's really too late, it seems like, to start talking with them. Like, we need to start building this conversation and, and this framework earlier um, to help address just the epidemic that's happening. Um, when we discuss stats, it's important to keep in mind that the basic, basically the stats are underreported. There are a lot of people who don't report for a variety of reasons. One, of course, is the knowledge of what happens when they report, um, you know, because it's still unfortunately very common that when you get, when you report, you will be put through the ringer. You will, you know, people are going to ask you, what were you wearing, where were you, were you drinking, what were you doing? So a lot of people still don't report, and of course a lot of males don't report because there's that additional stigma of being a male survivor of sexual abuse. Um, in fact, there was a recent report that just came out that indicated that the incidences of, um, like it used to be believed that like only 10% of sexual violence victims were female, or were males, excuse me, but a recent report came out saying that it may be as high as 40% um, based on underreporting, and of course when you consider, when you add in things like rape in prison, um, which I guess they weren't exclude, they weren't including that in the stats, but I mean it's still rape and it's still something we need to talk about because it's still a horrific crime. So, um, and another important thing for us to remember, when we're talking about teens and sex and consent, um, and I know it makes some adults really uncomfortable because, you know, people have very personal opinions about teens and teens having sex and even, you know, sex outside of marriage. Um, but whether or not teens are having sex, teens are thinking about sex and they're trying to figure sex out and they're trying to decide, you know, what their personal views and opinions about sex are. Um, and it's a, just as it, the teenage years are an important time of identity formation, it's also an important time of their sexual identity formation, deciding, you know, what they think about sex and whether or not they're going to have sex and who they're going to have sex with and what they want the sexual experience to be like. So that's another reason why it's really important that we do have these conversations because um, we want them to be able to, when they're talking about it in any situation, be able to express what their needs are, what their wants are, to know that they can say yes or that they can say no and that they can have, you know, a positive sexual experience. Yeah. And I'm just going to piggyback on that and say um, what's been fascinating to me in talking to teenagers and because I do a lot of speaking engagements with um, high schoolers, um, what's been sort of fascinating to me is hearing um, what they define as rape, you know, and, and what they consider rape and what they don't. Um, I, I remember a few years ago I was talking to high schoolers and it was right after the Steubenville ha thing happened. And um, I asked them, and it was a room of maybe 45 kids, and I described the scenario because most of them hadn't heard of Steubenville, and I said, do you think this is rape? And almost all of them said no. And this was fascinating to me because I thought, where is the disconnect here that's happening either from conversations at home or conversations in school? Where is the disconnect that there's not a fundamental understanding of what rape is and what it is not, what consent is, what it is not? You know, and, and this was really interesting to me because it felt like sort of um, 
this hole in, in important education, important conversations we should be having and are not. Um, so I love that YA is sort of dealing with this and tackling this issue because I think it creates those kind of dialogues where you could say, do you think this is rape? Do you think this is consent? You know, and, and have those, those conversations in a pretty open and safe forum around this. Yes. Um, and I, I think, too, it's important that we keep in mind that part of sex education involves allowing teens to understand how to have dialogues about sex. I mean, we want to just like have, you know, like we think, oh, I just want to give you the facts and, and do this. But I think particularly to piggyback on Chris's point, helping them to understand what sexual violence is, like not just what sex is, but what healthy sex is and what, you know, unhealthy sex can be and what consent is. Um, because I think that's where we're failing in part of our sex education. Um, so, excellent. Um, so, one of the things that often comes up when we start talking about sex in YA and sexual violence in YA is people, you know, get concerned that it's too dark to be having these conversations with teens. But the thing we need to keep in mind is that, um, you know, we just read the stats, so we know that there are many teens that the, this is actually their life. This is actually happening to them. So, you know, we can't say it's too dark for them to read about because they're unliving it, and they're living it, and that's unfortunate. Um, so, and occasionally they might find that book that helps them to realize that, you know, this, this is not okay, and I'm going to ask for help. And I think that's one of the important, empowering things that can happen from YA literature. Um, another thing is, is for me as somebody who works with teens, for my my daughter who you know has friends that are in the teenage group, um, I want them to be able to understand the lives of other people. You know, we always talk about reading as taking a step in somebody else's shoes, and I think it's important we remember that that means that sometimes we have to take a step into some very dark shoes and see some very dark lives. And that helps us to build compassion and empathy and to know how to support and lift up people in situations if they're not, if those situations are not our own. Um, Krista is actually working on right now a post for us about the idea of first responders. A first responder is someone who, um, you know, a teen will come to you and say, you know, this is something that's happening in my life and I don't know what to do about it. Oftentimes that first responder will be a friend, so it will be another teenager, or it might be you, a librarian, um, somebody who works with teens, uh, an educator, or the parent, you know, of a friend. Um, and so, again, it's just that idea that these books can help us understand what's happening and how it happens, and and even give us some ideas of how to respond appropriately when it does happen. Um, and then I just think that when we give examples, and we have to give positive and negative examples, um, that people, that teen readers then can start to develop for themselves their own ideas of, of what they want their sexual life to look like. And it doesn't mean that they have to be having sex right now. It can still be this idea of when I get older and decide to have sex, this is what I want my relationships to look like. Um, this is what I think is going to be healthy and, and good for me. And do you have anything you want to add to that, Krista? Yeah, I think that's right. I think it's it's um, sort of going through your uh, the the motions of figuring out what you really want, what you want for yourself. That's not based on, I guess, what's popular or what everyone else is doing. I mean, those are difficult questions, and and I think when we don't address them in different forums, that it, that. It, 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 I think like what I tell my kids is it's like bus talk, you know, where I always say like, okay, whatever you hear on the bus, if it sounds in any way dubious, like come back to me and we'll have a conversation about it because I think that sometimes that, that bus talk can be sort of this domino effect of, well, everyone's doing this or everyone's, you know, and, and these things to me are sort of fascinating because it, it, it's like the tools that are being given to teenagers are coming from other teenagers or from, you know, whoever is talking about this. And these, this 
in my mind, shouldn't be the way it goes. These tools need to come from sort of a little bit more informed sources, sources people who know what they're, what they're doing, who have kind of been through it or, or talk about it. And, um, and then just the other thing I wanted to add on the idea of first responders is um, why I've always talked kind of primarily with my teenagers about being first responders is that in the and you know that's the reality of things is that teenagers tell their friends first if something you know like at least you know that that happens most of the time is is that they're they're the ones hearing it first sometimes it'll be a teacher but often very often it's a friend first and so the it it's a really interesting thing to have because here you're being given like this very important information and if you don't know how to respond to that or you respond in a way that makes the survivor feel bad, like that might be the end of that story. You know what I'm saying? Like I know people who the very first person they told said something to them that made them feel like I never want to tell anyone again. I'm never going to tell anyone else. And then they don't tell anyone for 10 more years because of that very first response and how critical that is. And that's why these conversations, these dialogues with teenagers end up being really crucial because we're in a place where we have to say, like, how do you respond when someone says this to you? What are, you know, and, it, and it's hard because you're not developing little social workers. You don't want them to, head, to, to be in charge of that and, and have to be, you know, take on someone else's emotional landscape. But you at least want to give them enough to be able to say, like, these are, this is the way that this looks when it feels good for someone. You know, if you even just say, I'm sorry that happened to you, that can do a world of good to a survivor. Um, and similarly, if you say, well, whatever, what were you doing with that guy anyway? Don't you know his reputation? Then that you've just done something incredibly damaging. And so these are conversations that I feel like are really great to see because in, in the books that we've covered this year, it sort of has run the gambit of, of a really positive sort of first responder response and really some bad ones. So anyway. Yeah, Chris is going to be talking more about that next week with us, so we're excited about that because um, she obviously has a lot of good information on that. Um, so. I always feel like I'm like the clinical one, and Krista's like got all this passion. I'm like the clinical one, but no, so, stop. That's not true. <laughs> so when we talk about sexual assault or sexual violence, I just want to give it a, a a brief definition of of what we're talking about. Um, and it it was interesting to see because obviously we're not talking about just rape. It can be a lot of different things. Um, it can be somebody exposing themselves to someone. It can be somebody sending them a photograph or asking for a photograph. Um, it could be exposing somebody else to pornography. Um, I recently read that the the average age of exposure to pornography is 10. So um, that's again another reason why we you know we can pretend this isn't happening or we can acknowledge that it is happening and have these conversations even if they make as uncomfortable. Um, sexual harassment, and um, I get responses all the time from girls in middle school and high school telling me about the sexual harassment that they experience in schools on their way to and from school at school hosted events. Um, sexual harassment, I think we need to be doing a lot more talking about in our schools um, because it, you know, it's happening. Um, and the stories I hear are you know, really sad, and then the responsive, like this is just the way it is, and we just have to live with it, and this is, you know, boys will be boys, and this is just the way the boys talk. Well, I, I don't think that that's true. I think that we should be talking with, you know, each other about what is an acceptable way to talk to one another and how to have conversations about sex with one another that makes everybody still feel safe. Um, and the idea that, you know, our students should be able to, you know, navigate the hallways in school and feel safe. Um, so, um, I feel strongly about sexual harassment, sorry. Um, unwanted touching, um, rape, and acquaintance rape, um, I talk, uh, A.S. King, author A.S. King, who's amazing, by the way, is going to be talking with us in November about this topic. Um, 
But when I was talking to her back and forth in email, um, she has a book coming out in 2015 on the topic of acquaintance rape or what's also called date rape. You know, and she made an excellent point. She's like, I hate that we call it that because it should just be called rape. It's just rape. You know, it just happens to be, you know, not what people consider rape to be, which we're going to talk about in a moment. Mm -hmm. um, and then also sexual exploitation and human trafficking. Um, so, and I'm sure there's still other things that aren't on that list, but uh, when we talk about the sexual violence and the sexual violence in Wyatt Project, we're not just talking about rape because sexual violence can occur in a variety of ways um, and all of them matter um, and, you know, none of them are okay. Do you have anything you want to add, Krista? No, I think that's very good. I'm glad you put the um, photography and the exposure in. I think that, the, you know, just a little sidebar on this is um, social media harassment and um, uh, I feel like that this is sort of a new paradigm in our with our young people is this idea of um, you know either I mean it could be rape threats it could be pictures it can be anything but the idea that um, social media is playing such a crucial part of their development and their and and honestly their sexual development and how that can be used both in the positive and in the negative way. So uh, I, I think that's a, it's a really good, um, it, it's a good talk to cover. Um, I mean, I feel like you could probably do an entire webinar just on social media. Um, but uh, I, I'm glad that you, you included that in there because I think that it's critical, critical as part of this dialogue too. Yeah. And, you know, I've had... Um I've, I've, I've had some teen programs where I'd be in an event with a room full of teens and all of a sudden this teen will get something on his phone and he'll share it to some, show it to somebody else and they'll start laughing and I'll be like, what is it? And I'll be like, you know, they're like, oh, you can't see. And, you know, I'll be like, you know, you can't show other people those nasty things on your phone. Like, you can't do that. You need to understand that that's not okay. Um, you know, like, you can't do it here. <laughs> And you have to be careful what you're showing, you know, because um, if you're showing a, a picture of somebody who's underage, then it becomes child pornography, and that's a whole other legal issue. Um, and, and even if you're a teen showing another teen, then you can be charged with that, which we've seen many times in the media, and actually comes up in the, the book Thousand Word, A Thousand Words by, um, oh, if only I could think of the author's name right this moment. I'll look it up while you keep talking. Okay. So anyhow, but um, and here are some good resources to get started for you. Um, RAIN is the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network. They have a really good breakdown of all the different things that are considered sexual violence. Um, there is an organization called Stop Street Harassment, which talks specifically about street harassment. Um, and I think street harassment also applies to sexual harassment in the schools because that's, you know, the streets that the kids are walking during the day. Um, and the Good Men Project has a lot of good resources, including the fact that they have like a little chart that breaks down um, how you can talk about consent with different age groups. So there's just some resources for you. Um, so we're going to start by talking a little bit about what we've learned about sexual violence. When we think about rape, most people think of rape as being um, you know, I came home and a man came through my window with a gun or a knife or he jumped out of the bushes while I was walking to my car. The truth of the matter is, is that a majority of rape happens not by a stranger but by someone that the person knows. Um, it can be a family member, a, a, a mom or a dad, a brother or sister, an aunt or an uncle, a grandparent. But the truth is, is that a majority of people are not raped by a complete stranger. They are raped by somebody who is known to them. Um, and a lot of times they have a relationship with them. Sometimes, unfortunately, they're forced to continue to have a relationship with them in some type of capacity. Um, two example, really good examples of this is the book Charm and Strange by Stephanie um, Keen. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. And by the way, a thousand words is Jennifer Brown. Jennifer Brown. Right, the hate words. list. Yeah, that that yeah. yeah. I knew it was a J, I just couldn't think. Yeah. 
Um, Charm and Strange by Stephanie Keen is, um, it was the Morris winner of last year, right, Krista? Yes, it was. Yes. Um, and it is the story of, of a young boy. We meet him in school, and it kind of alternates, like, the past and the present. And he, you kind of think that he has, like, these two different personality things going on. And slowly you fight, start to find out, like, what happened to him, um, and it doesn't involve abuse, um, sexual violence from a family member. It is a great story. It is very hard to read, um, but it does a really good job of showing a lot of important things, um, including it reminds us of the fact that not all sexual violence is against women, because this is a, a, a male protagonist who is the victim. It shows us um, how it can be systemic. Um, like, it, for some people, it's a cycle of violence, and that plays into this book as well. Um, and you should just read it. Live Through This by Mindy Scott is a really um, excellent story. I read it a couple of months ago for the project. Um, and it involves a, a young girl who, um, and I will remember no character's name I'm talking about any of this. I'm so sorry. Um, but she um, is in high school, and she's starting to date this boy, which brings up all these emotions for her um, because, you know, she feels some guilt and shame and some just confused about some issues because of things that happened to her in her life. And you find out eventually that she was abused by a member of her family. Um, and it's a very good depiction of just the complexity of the emotional response. But it's also a really good depiction of, you know, and reminder for us that a majority of rape is not by a complete stranger. Um, and it can be uh, involve a lot of different types of relationships. It can be family members, it can be coaches, it can be teachers, it can be a wide variety of people. Um, and then yeah. seeing, too, how those relationships can work and, like, some of the grooming and stuff involved. Kristen? Yeah. Well, no, I was going to say, it, 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 the last statistic I read was 85% is someone that the survivor knows. So that's a really high number. Um, and, and not to say 85% is a family member, just 85% of rapes are perpetuated by someone the survivor knows. Um, but in both these cases, what I thought was excellent about both these books was the way that um, uh, PTSD was handled sort of within that um, that realm of um, you know like it's sort of after the fact but also too like it was sort of current PTSD going on and um, you know sometimes also called rape trauma syndrome and it was a really interesting thing sort of seeing how these both um, because you know, I would say like because it's family members involved that these both sort of plagued both these characters in a way that really wrecked them mentally in terms of their mental health. Um, and I think incest in general is a really deeply complicated um, a, a rape by a family member is a really dip, deeply complicated issue um, because you're talking about power dynamics within the family, but you're also talking about the um, the the secrets I think behind this and in, in particularly when you're talking about family members the wealth of secrets that and, and what family dynamics will happen and family systems will happen to keep those secrets within the family as opposed to ever telling anyone outside of that is um, incredibly difficult and it makes this layer even more intense I think sometimes because you're talking about you know um, you know, we talk a lot about the voiceless or people who are not able to report rape. I think that it's doubly complicated when you're talking about situations of uh, sexual violence within families. Oh, definitely. And these are really good examples of that. Um, one of the studies, you talked about the idea that 85% of, you know, victims are, are, you know, are raped by somebody they know. Um, when I found that really interesting to know that a lot of it occurs in like dating situation. A lot of teenagers dating are having, you know, what we consider domestic violence and rape in those dating situations. Um, 
they did a study and they said that um, between the ages of 16 and 24, they, the girls between the ages of 16 and 24 are three times more likely than the rest of the population to be abused by an intimate par partner. Um, it was the statistics for even just dating violence for teenage girls was really, really astounding to me. Um, and of course, then they don't necessarily differentiate in those statistics, but some of them are including rape statistics as well. So it's definitely something that's happening in the dating relationships of our teenagers. Um, and they also noted, I thought it was interesting, that violent behavior often begins between 6th and 12th grade. 72% of 13 and 14 year olds are dating, and then a you know, a significant portion of those dating relationships will include some type of violence. So um, I thought that that was some disturbing, you know, information. A couple of good examples of this idea of acquaintance rape, date rape, they want to call it, or partner rape, um, The Mockingbirds by Daisy Whitney and Inexcusable by Chris Lynch. I say that I will tell you that Inexcusable by Chris Lynch is a particularly very fascinating and interesting story because it's actually told from the male point of view who is the person who, um, when we, when he, at the beginning of the book, we see him, we meet him, and he's in a room with this girl who is accusing him of rape, and he's saying, no, 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 I, I, I didn't rape you, I couldn't rape you because I love you. And so it couldn't have been rape because I love you. And then he goes through several chapters, um, introducing himself to us, trying to explain to us that he's a good guy. It's really important for him for us to understand that he's a really good guy. And of course, he wouldn't rape her because he loved her, and it's a really, he's a really great guy. Um, and then you get to the end, where it's finally revealed what did happen. Um, and it's kind of left, kind of, you know, like, did he or didn't he? I say he definitely did, um, but it's a very, very discussable book. I think it's a, a great book to use with teens to ask those questions about, um, you know, what, what do you think about what he did and, and you know. Um, How would you define this? Do you consider this yes, rape? All those exactly. things, yeah. Um, and it's a powerful, powerful story. Um, and The Mockingbirds by Daisy Whitney involves um, a girl who wakes up and, and she realizes that she has been raped and she goes to a private school and the school has like their own like kind of student justice system um, and it's the process that she goes through, the way the students react to her claims that she was raped and the way that students react. Um, and the way the guy reacts, but you know, you get all those complex questions as well. Like, is this rape? Is this not rape? You know, what do you think? Um, again, very, very discussable, very well written. Yeah, and you know, the nice thing about the Mockingbirds is that even though it's set in sort of a boarding school and it's this school student ethics committee or whatever that's that's adjudicating this, is it's a great launching place into discussing how that works in colleges and on campus because. It, with campus, when you're talking about campus rape, very frequently it will not be dealt with by the police, but will be dealt with within the the campus, you know, bylaws and their and their adjudication system, their ethics committee, whatever they call it, on or their disciplinary committee, um, which is often peer related. So it's a really great. I feel like the Mockingbirds is, is so um, so great in talking about how this is often dealt with in colleges too, because. Um, you know, college campuses, uh, colleges are, have been scrutinized, you know, lately about um, their policies with regards to this. How are they dealing with it? And and we're seeing cases where um, the the perpetrators are staying on campus with with the the victims, and and like how that makes it really uncomfortable for the victim, and how they're you know, and that ultimately it ends up being the victims who have to leave school because the perpetrators were not expelled, nothing happened to them, or it was some small disciplinary action, and this, these kind of things. So it's a great, to me, that's a great example, too. Yeah. Excellent, yes. Um, it's important that, I just, when we talk about rape, I know that I tend to default into female pronouns, but it's also important for us to remember and keep in mind that boys are also the victims of sexual violence and we always want to emphasize that and, and keep that in people's minds. And you know, no matter who the victim is, and Krista makes, has a good quote where she talks about often the, the idea that, you know, 
people of sexual violence, they know no age, no race, no gender, no, I mean, you know, you hear in the news about babies being raped and sexually violated in some way, and you know, old, you know, elderly women up in their 80s and 90s. So, um, and it's, you know, male, female, they don't care about sexual orientation, and all sexual violence, all of it is, is wrong, it's not okay. Uh, Rain reports that 10% of sexual violence victims are male. Some recent information may suggest that it's high as 40%. Um, and here's two really good examples of this. And um, one of them just recently came out is Forgive Me Leonard Peacock by Matthew Quick. And he wrote The Silver Linings Playbook in Boy 21 and several other books. Um, and in Forgive Me Leonard Peacock, we met meet Leonard and um, it's his birthday and he's going out and he's going to deliver presents to I believe four people and then he's planning on having like a mass shooting school situation. Um, and as he goes through and he he talks about what's happening to him um, and he reveals to a teacher something that's happened to him and his teacher looks at him and says, you know, Leonard, you, you do know that boys can be raped, right? And this was just like the most profound, you know, a moment in a book that I've read in a really long time because that's what Leonard needed was somebody to tell him that this is what happened to him. Um, and then um, Swagger involves a, a, a boy on a high, school, a high school basketball team who another friend reveals to him that he's being sexually abused by the coach and this friend is trying to decide whether or not he's going to report the coach because it will have implications for him and you know his um, basketball career and these types of things. Um, so both of these, as I mentioned, are good examples of sexual violence um, against men uh, and teenage boys. Um, and we have a list on the, the blog of some other titles as well. Um, yeah. Gospel of Winter also comes to mind for me, yes. that, which is about uh, priests. Um, yeah. So, uh, and we're going to talk about that later. But yes, The Gospel of Winter is just a beautiful, brilliant book um, about, as Krista mentioned, um, the sexual abuse scandal in the, the Catholic Church. And as far as I know, it is the only book about that and that type of violence. So that's... In YA um, literature? Yeah, I, maybe. In I YA literature that yeah. I know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. All right. Um, so the next thing we want to talk to you guys is about what consent is. Um, and this can... I think this is where the idea gets lost for some of our... our you know, well, everyone actually, um, but basically the general idea of consent is that both parties have to be able and willing to consent to some type of sexual interaction. So um, this means that both people have to be able, which means they have to be of sound mind, they have to be old enough to understand what's happening, they have to be, um, you know, clear-headed, which means not intoxicated, not under the influence of drugs, um, and they have, it has to be of their free will, which means, um, and this is where it gets a little bit trickier, because we talk about things like emotional manipulation, threats, you know, this whole idea of, like, if you love me, you would do this for me, um, you know, that's, that's not necessarily healthy communication about sex. Um, yeah. and, we need to have those conversations with teenagers. Um, I think you can, one of the partners can be able to express their desire to have sex and do so in a way that doesn't guilt or manipulate or, you know, try to coerce the other person. Um, and then part of that is also understanding that you, the other person has the right to say no, you know. Um, and consent is more than just the absence of no. This is something I think we really need to be talking to everybody about. Um, but what you want is to have both parties say yes. Um, you know, um, a lot of people, when you read a lot of personal narratives about sexual violence, and they'll talk about the idea that when it was happening to them, they froze up. Um, you know, so they didn't say no verbally, but they were definitely saying no in, in body language and even sometimes trying to fight the person off. So, but this idea that, you know, no means no, that's a great idea, but it's even better the idea of yes means yes. Um, it's important for everybody to understand that um, even if we start having a sexual relationship, that person has the right to end that sexual relationship at any time. 
you can withdraw consent, um, and that um, even like a person can start a sexual interaction and then decide in the midst of it that no, this I'm not comfortable with this. This isn't right for me. We need to stop. You know, so um, two of my favorite examples of this is the book Infinity Less by Myra McIntyre. It's the third book in the Hourglass series. Um, and it focuses on, on these two characters, and um, they are having this flirtation. There's a lot of sexual tension between them. And finally, it gets to the point where it looks like, yes, we're really going to do this. And the male character just flat out looks at the female character and says, so I have the green light to continue. Like, this is what you want to do, right? Um, and it's awesome. That's one of my favorite books. It's one of my favorite moments in the book. And um, it's just a great situation. Um, and in Plus One by Elizabeth Fama. Fama, how do you say it, Krista? Fama. 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 Thank you. Um, they actually have a conversation and decide they're going to have sex. Then in the midst of the sex, the girl starts crying. And the, teen, the boy that she's having sex with, you know, notices what's happening, and he kind of stops for a moment. He says, like, are, are you okay? Is this what you want to be doing? Um, and he doesn't know. She's just crying because to her this is a beautiful moment. But he sees her crying, and he takes a moment to check in with her in the midst of sex and say, like, you still want to be doing this? Is this still okay? And so that's a profound moment. Yeah, and you know, I just want to talk to this last point because you kind of brushed over it. The yes is not always a yes. Uh -huh. So um, this is the idea of, um, it, it, so what Karen's talking about here is what's called aff affirmative consent or enthusiastic consent. And this is a sort of the, the, next, um, the next step in what a lot of people are doing, educators are doing in terms of saying, you know, it's not just no means no, it, you need to have affirmative consent, enthusiastic consent. And I think what you're talking about here when in this yes is not always a yes is when you're talking about manipulation and coercion. So when you're, um, when it, it becomes, and, and plus one is an excellent example, because there's a part in it, um, and now I can't remember the character's name, but um, where she's making a, a, a she has a, a relationship with, or she has a, a, a soldier comes up and she ends up like going off into the bushes with him to get through the guards. Um, and it's very transactional, it's very, um, I mean, so it, this is a situation where sex has become transactional, and yes, she has agreed to it, but she's agreed to it uh, sort of under duress because she knows otherwise they're not going to get through these barriers. And so that's a conversation to have, not to say that in that particular case her yes means that, you know, anything else that that, that means that this girl was raped. She was not. She agreed to it, but there's also something to that it's a discussion point with teenagers in terms of when things are transactional or when there's coercion involved or when you're talking about there's a, a manipulation that, that it becomes, well, if you want this, then you have to do this. And, and this isn't healthy sex. That's not healthy. So I just wanted to speak to that point because that was a little confusing. So go ahead, Karen. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, so there are a few laws that discuss the idea of consent. Um, typically, in most states, and you should check your local state laws, consent can't happen before the age of 16. Like, people who are considered younger than 16 cannot consent to sex. Um, then also, um, when you're talking about people under the age of 18, there's usually, there's an echo all of a sudden. Um, a three-year age difference. Okay. okay. So if you, uh, you like a 16-year-old couldn't have couldn't sex have with sex anyone like over the over age the of, you know, 20 or, or over. Um, because and the reason those laws are exist are, are some of the power dynamics that Krista was just talking about. Um, that's why some of those age consent laws that are there, especially when you talk about the age gap um, for minors under the age of 18. Um, who might be involved in a relationship with somebody who is over the 18, age of 18. Uh, so you'll want to check the laws for your state there. 
And of course, um, if a person is intoxicated or under the influence of drugs, their ability to consent is compromised. And I think this is where a lot of discussion lately about consent has come up. You see it in the Stephenville case. Um, you see it a lot when we talk about college campus rates. Um, and you'll see article after article after article that will say, like, you know, to help the rape crisis, you know, women shouldn't drink. Um, well, you know. Or people should just not rape them, really. Is yes, what exactly. The rape <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's important to remember that people who are under the influence of drug and alcohol, um, you know, can't consent to the full extent because, you know, we know that it can influence, um, especially like, you know, people who are intoxicated to the point where they're like, they can't stand up or, you know, they might be passed out. It just, it, it seems like you should go without saying, you know, don't rape them, you know. There's a really great conversation about this in the book, This Song Will Save Your Life by Leila Sales. And there's a, a group of people, and they're in a, a club, and um, these girls are talking, and this girl looks over, and she sees another girl. She's being, like, held up against the wall by some men. She's obviously really intoxicated. I mean, she can't really stand up. Um, but And there's some boys holding her up, and one of them is, like, talking or, you know, kissing, and the girl sees what's happening and walks over to them and says, you know, what are you doing? Leave her alone. And they're like, no, it's okay. She wants this. And they're like, no, she can't consent. She's too drunk to consent. You're taking advantage of her. And I think that this scene is such an important scene for two reasons. One, it discusses that concept of, you know, um, consent. But it also gives us an example of where they talk about the idea of being a bystander and how when you see something happening to somebody else, you can intervene and stand up for them and help them out in that situation, which some of those cases that we see in the news would have gone so much differently if those team, other teens at the parties would have felt empowered to say, stop doing this. This is not okay. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I deal with the, this issue a little bit in fault line, too, and um, one of the things that is addressed is... Um, not necessarily the active bystander, but the um, idea of not being able to consent because you've had too much to drink. And, and it was interesting because I got a, like a review on um, Goodreads once that said something like, I'm tired of drunk girls crying rape. And I was so jarring to me and so like difficult to hear or to read because I thought, oh, do people really think this? Like, or is you know? And I think that that's still sort of there's a mystique or a, a, you know that there are people who still think that. I, I recall that Fox News guy who, um, when Daisy Coleman, the Daisy Coleman story came out, the Fox, this guy on Fox News said something like, well, yeah, I mean, I guess she was raped, but. And there was sort of this but, you know, but she was drinking a ton, but, you know, all these things. And, and to me, part of this project is figuring out a way to talk to people so that we take the but out of that conversation. Right. So. Um, and this next slide is about the other part of consent that you were kind of talking about earlier, the coercive consent. Um, yeah. So did you, did you want me to take this one, Karen? Go for it. Go for it. Um, I know we're running out of time, and I, we want to top line this. But um, so this is great. Um, Point is excellent. It's an amazing book. Um, it deals with a lot of different issues coming up. But one particular one, which I think is really excellent, is uh, it's a great example of both an age power dynamic that's happening and, um, and the idea of being emotionally manipulated into consenting. So um, we, we sort of find out in, within that, that, that book that the younger, uh, or the girl who's the protagonist, when she was a younger, I think 13, got in a relationship with a guy who said he was, I think, 18. And it turns out he was like, you know, 23 or something. But um, he, like, the flashbacks that she has to that time, you can see how it's woven in and it's become really emotionally co coercive and manipulative 
where he sort of talks her into wanting to do this so that she really buys into it, that she really thinks that she wants to do it. And, and so the very, like much of that narrative through that book is her justifying this relationship that she had with this guy and you know everything about it and it's fascinating because I think that that's very true in terms of teen girls and I thought that that rang particularly true to me was this justification of well I wanted this I hooked up with them it was everything I made this choice and and there's and there's a part where you say okay but you were 13 and he used all these sort of he manipulated this chessboard against you so that of course you made that choice because he made you feel desirable and he made you feel craved and wanted and all these things that is really using um, in this particular case that that place that is of prepubescence where that 13 year old place where really you want that you're sort of on the cusp of, of wanting to be an adult or treated that way and so it's really you know to me as a very fascinating um, in terms of that particular book and and how you know up until the very end she is rationalizing this relationship but you can see how it plays out in many of her other relationships in that book um, and then Karen did you want to talk about bleed since you were the one who sort of took that and understood that <laughs> as opposed to me talking about my own book did you just mute yourself Karen all right, we lost Karen. Um, okay, well then I'll talk about no, it. No. Uh, oh, there you are. Yes. Um, I muted myself while you were talking because my dog started barking. I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, can you talk about Bleed Like Me for a second? Yes, I will talk about it. So the thing about Bleed is that it has, um, it's about a relate. Uh, uh, relationship between this this boy and this girl and um, basically she's very alone um, she is the she has three adopted brothers who take up almost all of her parents time and this girl has become sort of invisible in her house and um, in her life and this boy comes in and he's in the foster system and he sort of talks himself her talks her into him um, and and you know along the way says things that end up being very controlling we're gonna do this we're gonna um, you're gonna stop doing this and it's very um, it plays out in this way that you realize that she just craves someone to feel this way about her so much or to want her this much that she's willing to go along with a lot of I guess shenanigans that he talks her into and um, it ends up being incredibly destructive for both of them. Um, but, you know, for her in particular, because she, um, I wouldn't say that she goes against form so much as she goes along with him in a lot of things and he sort of becomes the navigator of that relationship. And so there's a lot of things that, that is, is just emotional because she feels like he's the only thing for her and he ends up isolating her and you know the two of them take off on this road trip and end up moving to Minneapolis and and there's all these other impacts that happen and you you start to realize as it unfolds that like you know she has been been you know her own vulnerable state or her emotionally vulnerable state has you know opened it opened the door into this so into a really unhealthy relationship. Okay. Okay. So I'm sorry about that. Somebody was at my door. Um, I just wanted to say I read. I I'm one of people who read Believe Like Me, um, and it's an excellent book. And I think it really touches on those nuances of consent, um, um, particularly like as Krista mentioned, the the emotional aspects of consent. So um, I hope everybody will read that when it comes out. Um, another thing that we just want to touch briefly on, and I know we're almost out of time, is um, what we can learn through reading the literature about how teens react to sexual violence, um, and not just teens, anybody really, any survivor. Probably one of the classic examples when we talk about sexual violence is Speak by Lori Halsey Anderson. And, um, 
what we see there is the character withdrawing, shutting down. She withdraws into herself and really shuts down. And I think a lot of people think that is how all people react to sexual violence, and that is not necessarily so. It is certainly one of the ways that people can react. Um, one of the things that I learned through this project that really changed a lot of things for me was seeing how some teens become really sexually active after sexual violence, um, either because, like as we see in Fault Line by Krista, uh, because they've been labeled a slut, um, and so their whole idea is if people are going to think this about me, then I might as well just be it. Um, but also the idea of um, I, I want to try to seek out sexual relationships because I want to have a healthy one to erase this negative one. Um, we mentioned briefly the Gospel of Winter, and I think one of the excellent things we've seen in this is this idea that um, a lot of teens will turn to drug and alcohol use um, after sexual violence for the same reason that really probably most people turn to sexual drugs or turn to drugs and alcohol to kind of just numb the pain. Um, with Charm and Strange, we talked about the idea of PTSD, also um, a variety of other mental health issues and disassociative behaviors. Um, and of course, they can have a lot of sexual confusion, shame, doubt, guilt, um, just a lot of emotional responses to that. And through reading all of these different books, you can see the different ways that people react. Um, but I think the other thing for me is somebody who works with teens, it reminds me that when I see teens in my library engaging in what I might consider to be bad behavior, it's also important to take a moment and consider that there might be reasons why they are engaging in this behavior. Um, I don't want us to just write off, you know, the teens that we interact with who are difficult to interact with as being problem teens, but we have to understand that sometimes there's really um, profound reasons behind why they have these behaviors. Um, yeah, and, there's almost always trauma. I always right. think there's trauma there, there's trauma. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, and then Krista is going to take over for a few moments. Yeah. Okay, so um, when we one one of the aspects we've talked about with this project is um, this idea of slut shaming, and it was actually really interesting because um, I am trying to think who was the one who noticed the slut list on the on the Goodreads the um, I think it was slut shelf. Alexander Duncan. Okay, Alexander Duncan did a whole thing on um, the slut shelf and how one of her books had been, or her book had been put on this uh, someone's Goodreads slut shelf, and it was really interesting because she um, was talking about, you know, what makes us, I guess, go to that place, what makes us think about, um, you know, or make judgments on girls who are promiscuous, um, what makes us sort of. Uh, you know, in my mind at least, separate ourselves um, from, you know, uh, and, and one of the things that I think a lot of these books explore, especially the books that explore um, promiscuity or, you know, being easy or any of those things that people, sort of buzzwords that people use, is the idea of, well, two things. One is the idea that if, if a girl has sexual agency, that that somehow that makes her either a slut or you know you know that she's got some baggage and this is really interesting to me because I think that um, sex and violence Carrie Mizrovian sex and violence deals with a girl who has just a really positive sexual outlook um, and it's a it's a really nice contrast because it, it talks you know it it deals with the nuance of girls who have sexual agency you know, and, and um, our sexual beings and how that doesn't necessarily make them sluts or easy or those kind of things. Um, and then, um, Karen, you got to go back one in your slide because oh. I want to talk about truth, the, um, about yes. Alice. Yes. Um, and then what, and then in the truth about Alice, which is um, Jennifer Mathieu's book, um, this is a really great Thing, um, book for me because it talks a lot about or it deals with the issue about rumors and what makes 
um, you know, rumors get started and it's told from all these different points of view until almost the very end when we finally get Alice's point of view. And, and it's, it's beautifully crafted because it deals with everyone's voice but Alice until the very end. And then it also deals with the idea that all these people just created rumors around her and then she just and, and then it was decided that she's a slut. And part of it was that Alice you know did was sexually engaged and did have a sex life. But then it sort of got taken into this bigger thing and because she was that way or because she had friends who knew that she had at one point done oral sex with a the guy, then it turned into this much bigger thing. And to me, this is a really interesting thing because it talks a lot about the nuances of rumors in high school and what that means and what, how that for us, for our benefit, how that talks, that deals with the issue of sexual violence. So this is just a really quick story, but I had a friend who um, is a high school teacher and, one of, and he told me this story about how this girl and this guy were making out outside at the lockers and they went inside uh, and she followed him into the guy's bathroom and when she came out she told the teacher that he had raped her. And this, every, of course, the rumors all around the school went around this. And that when my friend was talking to his class about it, because they told him, um, mo most of the students in his class said, well, what did she expect? She followed him into the guy's bathroom. And this, to me, was so interesting that there was an immediate, like, um, an immediate decision that she was asking for it or for whatever happened, she made that choice to go in the guy's bathroom. And, and, and it goes along with the same idea of, well, what did she expect? She was wearing a really short skirt or what did she expect? She was drinking or what did she expect? She was hanging out with that guy who's a total player. You know, whatever these things are, it, it's a sort of a mythos around this. And I think part of what we've talked about a lot in our project is that I think people's tendency to slut shame or to want to say, well, she's different than me. I would have never followed a guy into the bathroom or I would have never been like Alice and hooked up with this older guy or I would have never done these things is our wanting to disassociate with the possibility that we could ever be raped or that our kids could ever be raped or that our sisters or whoever could ever be raped is that we want to create some thing that made makes us different and sort of unrapeable and it's a really interesting conversation that's come out of this project is that there's nothing that makes you unrapeable I, I mean there's just nothing that, that we, you I've worked with survivors who are three I've worked with survivors who are 89 there is nothing that you can do that makes you you know there's no there there I guess anymore so um, one of the things that with the, the idea of slut shaming and when you try and distance yourself is that it perpetuates a silence. It perpetuates a silence for girls who are sexually active and who are raped because they think, did I deserve this? Did I, you know, was it because I was wearing this? And they, they tend to blame themselves. And so it, it creates um, a thing. And so it's been one of the good things that's happened out of this project is being able to have a really good, honest conversation about when you start slut shaming or when you start labeling girls as sluts or when you say things like what did you expect you know then you're you're creating a, a silence and then one other point about this that Jennifer had written a blog post on was um, that there is similarly a mythos around boys and that boys have to want sex all the time or they have to be players or what the expectations of boys are in this and it's equally problematic. It's, it, it has the exact same problem that when you insist that girls don't have any sexual agency in the same thing that you insist that boys have, are always wanting to have sex, it creates cultural stereotypes that are very difficult for teens to live up to or navigate or even work through and, and it makes it difficult for them. Um, Karen, did you want to jump on that? Or are we, okay, we're moving on. <laughs> uh, okay, so then um, 
the other thing um, that we wanted to talk about and that we've been talking about is because this is kind of a downer of a project in some ways. I mean, it's a wonderful project, but it's very difficult because there's so much around this idea of God, like it's relentlessly painful sometimes and difficult. Um, and one of the things that we wanted to talk about, which um, Karen dealt with a little bit in the consent thing, is why literature that has really sex positive scenes or things that are sort of really wonderful about girls making decisions, girls and boys making decisions about what they really want and what their own um, I guess what their own sexual agency is without feeling like they were coerced or manipulated or any of those things. And three examples that we have here. Um, I, I love The Duff. I think that The Duff is one of the most sex positive YA books I've ever read. I think she handles the subject really well. I think it's really interesting the decisions she makes. And I think that, and like, obviously there's consent on both parts. Obviously there's good dialogue around this. And it's, um, it felt all of it feels very real and authentic to me. Um, and, and similarly, in The Summer I Found You, I love that um, the, the summer I found you is about a diabetic girl who is dating a guy who has just returned from Afghanistan and he has one arm. And there, the, the sort of the sex scene between them is really interesting because at the very beginning she is dating a different guy and has been for a really long time and has not chosen to have sex with that guy. And then she meets this, and then they break up, and then she meets this new guy, and after a fairly short period of time, she decides to have sex with him. And the conversation around it, and whether when she felt ready for it, was really interesting, because you could see that she was like, you know, all these parts about connection and what she wanted and when she was ready all came into play. And then between the two of them, that scene in itself is very sex positive because it's awkward and wonderful and has all these different things because he's like, I don't, I, I haven't done this since I lost my arm. And so she's helping him and there's like all these wonderful aspects to it um, that also makes you feel like this is real. This. This is how it can sometimes go, but there's constant dialogue, constant conversation around them both being on board for this. Um, and I will always forever love um, Gail Foreman's If I Stay, um, because I think that, that, that the sex scene in that and sort of her nerves around it and everything that happens with that is so magical because that also felt really real to me and also really both, uh, but really positive for both of them, but also to um, really um, awkward and kind of wonderful that she was like, I'm super nervous, like how is this going to be? And, and, and that was very truthful. And I love that he says like, you know, play me like an instrument because this is their, their mutual thing. And, and so you get also to, I guess, love and affection and all of those aspects in there without having it to be like deep, true love. I mean, in, if I say, obviously, that's the place of it. But there's also, these are also examples of, you know, it, this doesn't have to be a one and only marriage kind of situation. You can talk about having these thoughts and wanting to do this and wanting to be in that space and all the awkwardness of it, and it's pretty great. So, um, and also too, in all of these, none of these books are just about sex, which I like too. This is one aspect of them, but they're, they're you know, they're complicated plots or they, they're very intricate. So, okay, moving on. We, we had to finish this oh. soon, Karen. This is the last slide, so we're good. Oh, we're yay. so sorry. Good. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, so what can you do with all of this information? Um, and I'm right now. I'm going to speak specifically to like the public and school library environment. Um, one is know what the laws are for your state. Particularly, you'll want to know if you're a mandated reporter. Have a discussion with your administrator once you find out what all the laws are, including the laws about the age of consent. Um, have a have a discussion with your administrator. Write a policy for your library. Make sure it outlines what staff will do, and then take and train the staff what that policy is and how to enforce that policy. It's important to note that if it's something is defined as criminal activity, your response should be to call the police. But some of the stuff when we talk about like sexual harassment type of things, 
Um, you should address that in your policy. You should have a, a code of conduct and a behavior. Um, but you don't, you know, like if you overhear a team saying something to another team. That's not something necessarily you have to call the police for, but it's something that you want to address. Um, and maybe even ask the the team to leave for the day. You know, um, after you explain why. What we want to do is create safe spaces in our schools and our libraries. So, like I said, have a code of conduct. Um, it should be, you should have a code of conduct for staff and you should have a code of conduct for patrons. Um, and, you know, have a code of conduct and post it in the public where people can see. Um, then, like I said, you're going to train your staff about the issues. You are going to give them very specific actions about how to respond if complaints are made or if you, or if you witness something happening. Um, have a staff training day, role play those type of scenarios, and then make sure that you are actively enforcing the code of conduct. Um, then you'll also want to know about local resources in your local community. Know who teens can you can refer your teens to if they come to you. Um, um, you can contact your local hospital. Sometimes they will have what's called a SANE nurse. It's a sexual assault nurse examiner. They will go out into the community and do education. They will come to your library. They will do either a, state, a staff training day or um, I have held seminars um, like on you know, violence, and dating violence and um, healthy relationships for teens. And they will come and hold those type of relation or have those type of seminars for you. Um, and, you know, I just put on my publicity that we were going to talk about sensitive topics so people who knew, people who were coming would know in advance and you're kind of covered. Um, but you can also contact local crisis centers. They might come and do some of these type of educational seminars with you. Um, but at the very least, network, make relationships with these people, have conversations with them, know what's happening in your community, know who you can refer people to, know what the law is. Um, and then you can use the books that were talked about in other books, um, and newer books will keep coming out. Um, have the conversations with your team. Um, and I know that it makes people sometimes uncomfortable, but I really think it's important that we have the conversations and that we use the literature to, um, to really engage teens in thoughtful dialogue. I know that in the fall, um, Jay Asher is getting ready to do the 50 States of Bullying Tour. Um, and his book, 13 Reasons Why, is actually a really good title to discuss, and there's a discussion guide on there. Um, speak, of course, um, there's discussion guides for that. And there are several other titles, and there are some discussion guides that are listed on the, the Project Hub for you to connect to. Great. Yeah. And, and also, too, like, know if you're mandated reporters. That would be the other thing. I don't know if with school librarians, I assume they are mandated reporters. Not everyone is, but um, it's probably something good for you to know if you do hear something, if you're a mandated reporter, um, because it impacts whether people can disclose to you. Um, so, you know, I, I think sometimes that uh, teens don't necessarily always feel feel comfortable disclosing, and if they start disclosing to you, you need to let them know that you're a mandated reporter first, because if they find out after that you've told their story that they didn't want anyone else to know, like that becomes a real problem. So um, they should know that first thing. Excellent, yes. And I, I believe that almost always anybody affiliated with the education system in a school is a mandated reporter, but as Krista says, definitely verify. That should be part of the, the conversation that you have in the legal issues. So the, the rest that we have is just some book lists for you and discussion guides and then some of the other resources we pulled up. You can look through those slides on your own. Um, I will tell you this is up at teenlibrarientoolbox.com, so you can flip through and you can follow through all the links and everything. This actual slide presentation is there. And then, of, of course, there, it's being recorded and archived, so you can address it that way. Um, I'm sorry that we talked too long. That's all right. We, we frequently go over, so yeah, this was all great information, so not a problem. 
All right. Thanks, Emily. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for coming and listening. Um, we didn't have any questions come in while you were talking. Um, if anybody does have questions, they can type them in right now. Um, while we're doing that, um, we have on the line Rochelle McPhillips, who is the chair of the Young Adult Roundtable at the Nebraska Library Association, and she said that she wanted to uh, make a comment when you guys were done. So, Rochelle, I have unmuted your microphone. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you, Karen and Krista for presenting for us today. I appreciate that. Um, as the chair of YARC this year, advocacy is a big issue for me. Uh, I see myself as an advocate in my library for teens. So um, I just wanted to add about mandatory reporters in the state of Nebraska. For anyone who's joining us from Nebraska, any adult is a mandatory reporter, uh, regardless of your job. Um, also, keep in mind the people at school, like your guidance counselors, your school nurses, teachers that kids talk about and talk about as trusted people. Um, sometimes I can't do things about what I'm told because of my position, but we can pull in another person, and we have done that in the past. So um, I, that's all I have. I just wanted to say thank you, and uh, I hope that I hope that we can have you back to continue this conversation sometime. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. It's such an important topic, and I I um, just appreciate the opportunity always to get to talk about it because uh, I think that we really see every day the effects of not only just sexual violence on the life of our teens, but just our teens trying to navigate this new sexual world that they're starting to think about and explore. So I think it is important to have these conversations, and I appreciate this opportunity. Absolutely. It's definitely important, and thank you, Karen and Krista, for joining us. Um, the, like they said, the links to this slides show will be on Teen Librarian Toolbox, and we will include a link to that in our um, when the recording is available for this Encompass Live, so you have all these links available, that's for sure. Um, thank you all for joining us, and we hope you'll come back for another Encompass Live.